So our, our next uh, our next talk is uh, is by uh, uh, Mike Villeneuve of the uh, of uh, NRGAN, GSC, and uh, he's going to talk about the uh, the targeted geoscience initiative. Uh, this uh, the TGI four is coming to an end, as, most, as many of you know, and uh, and so he's going to be he's going to be talking a lot about you know where where it came from and uh, where it could be going. Where, 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 we, where we are now and where it could be going in the future. So it's, it's titled New, New Public Geoscience Knowledge to Support Enhanced Effectiveness of Deep Exploration. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, Ken, for the invitation and the opportunity to present on this. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, as uh, Charles said, the tar Targeted Geoscience Initiative is uh, coming to a close. Uh, this phase of it, which is the fourth phase. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of give a run through uh, of what we've done, why we've done it, uh, and uh, a little flavor of what we've ac accomplished. Uh, we have a significant amount of publications, uh, results that have come out and are still coming out. So uh, I, far too many to, to touch, to talk about in detail uh, here, but uh, hopefully I'll give you a bit of a flavor. Um, the, uh, the starting point really for TGI-4 uh, was uh, really sourced in this, uh, this graph kind of shows the, the, uh, the issue that even though uh, in 2012 we were at not, uh, record exploration expenditures, these weren't really turning into discoveries and Canada as a whole was um, uh, was starting to, uh, there's been a gradual long-term decrease in the amount of uh, particularly base metals that have been produced from the country. So this is a bit of a worrisome trend for the government. Uh, they also uh, are a bit worried about the uh, implications for existing mining communities and jobs in those communities. Um, and another way of putting this is uh, on, on this graph which shows the uh, uh, constant dollar value of uh, finding a, uh, discovering an ounce of gold. And you can see from the 1950s through to the, today, it's gone up almost tenfold uh, in constant dollar terms, uh, which tells us that the exploration efficiency to find that gold is uh, going down. Uh, the other aspect is uh, the risk factor that enters into, um, drop that on the ground, um, is the uh, long-term uh, nature of the business that uh, takes a long time to turn a, uh, to first of all find a, a, a discovery and then turn that discovery into an active mine. And uh, so the uh, deposits as well were getting deeper. I think everyone's well aware of that. Uh, and uh, for that reason, uh, uh, Sorry, and I'll add on that the um, traditional uh, geoscience methods that we use uh, in uh, greenfield areas are really focused on uh, the top few hundred meters of, uh, of uh, the geology. They are very effective at uh, making discoveries in those, in those uh, top few hundred meters, but as we go deeper into higher risk zones, into areas that uh, require uh, long times to, to um, develop, uh, and that are expensive to find. Um, these all added up to a need for a government support to, uh, to help facilitate, lower the risk, and help uh, come up, uh, help the industry innovate to get more effective and efficient methods for discovery of those deposits. Uh, within uh, Canada, there's two types of uh, exploration environments. I think everyone's well aware of it. I think within Canada, that's a bit different is uh, the uh, remote and expansive areas, which are mostly in the north, um, have a lot of opportunity for new economic development. Uh, they're uh, greenfield areas. Uh, there's a lot of potential for near surface deposits and big ones. Uh, they're primarily of interest to the juniors. They're doing most of the exploration in these areas, where, which have little infrastructure. Um, so that is always an issue in terms of the development side. And in general, they're in areas of inadequate geoscience knowledge, and for that reason, the Government of Canada uh, created the Geomapping for Energy and Minerals Program, GEM, which uh, is focused on uh, creating those new economic um, 
uh, opportunities in the north uh, to support northerners. I'm not going to talk too much more about it at this point. That's a whole other program. And, and uh, what I'm going to focus on is our uh, needs within the active mineral regions. Uh, they're across the country, but they're mostly concentrated in the south. Uh, the, uh, the need there is for economic sustainability of these uh, deposits and these communities and the mining dependent communities. And of course, at its heart, governments are really focused on uh, the citizens and making sure that the, the economic well-being uh, of the citizens is taken care of. Uh, there are brown fields, near surface deposits are likely exploited. They're primarily of interest to miners, in other words, they're around existing mines, so that's uh, partly about extending the life of those, uh, those mines. And they have well-developed infrastructure, which uh, means that there's a lower barrier to development than there is perhaps in some of the, um, the uh, uh, northern areas that are devoid of infrastructure. And, and just as an example, you know, if you take something like the Ring of Fire, which is in a Greenfields area in Rabot, um, you know, it was discovered about the same time as the Victoria Mine in the uh, Sudbury Basin. And uh, it, uh, you know, the Victoria Mine is producing now. Uh, the Ring of Fire is probably uh, five years away, minimum, uh, if not more. Once it gets producing, it'll be great. But the, the timelines for developing a Greenfields area is, is uh, quite a bit longer. The, um, uh, and the last thing is, there's a lot of data that exists in these mining camps already. So uh, we want to use that data to help uh, dis um, move our um, under uh, understanding of ore deposits uh, along. Um, I throw this one up. I uh, blatantly stole it from uh, the Australians, from Thibault and all, uh, but I think it uh, demonstrates sort of the different uh, needs between the brownfields and greenfields camps. Uh, and, uh, you know, we really uh, want to move towards that um, uh, effective detection of the deposits. Uh, what we did was we really invested in public geoscience that creates a platform for development of uh, innovative deep exploration approaches by industry. Check that out. Um, and, uh, you know, I stress that we're here to create the platform for industry to innovate. The idea is not for us to, to create all the innovations ourselves. That's not the role of government. Uh, but we certainly want to create the data, the knowledge, the, the basis for which industry can, can pull from to, uh, to create innovative deep exploration approaches. Uh, TGI is uh, described below. I think I've adequately described it already. Uh, part of the objectives uh, are framed around uh, creating geoscience knowledge to support enhanced effectiveness in deep exploration. So we want to develop that new geoscience knowledge some innovative techniques that support that geoscience knowledge to, to model and detect Canada's major mineral systems. We're looking at aspects of system fertility as well as the vectoring to deposits. And a big part of it is the training and mentoring the next generation of uh, students to increase the HQP uh, available. Uh, it uses an ore systems program design. So we're integrating knowledge by comparing multiple ore systems across the country. It's not about an individual deposit. It's about tying the commonalities and differences of deposits that exist across the country. It's not geographically isolated, which means we're not working in specific geographic regions. We're not looking at a southern Abitibi project, for example. We're looking um, at ore deposits uh, or systems. Uh, we use scientific hypotheses to help direct our science that we do, and all the TGI core work is collaborative. We are about 200 uh, participants within the project from academia, from industry, from pro provincial and territorial governments. Uh, those of you who were at the innovation session uh, saw me put uh, saw this slide. Um, I cut out much of the, the bits around it, um, and. Uh, you know, really, I just wanted to restress here that there's two types of ways to drive innovation. And we often talk about the demand pull uh, type of innovation where there's a consumer demand arising from somebody who says, this is what we need. It's a bit like what Alan described, the industry defining their needs and saying, we need the innovations that feed into this. Uh, and uh, it's, it's demand driven and the end user has a, has, is well defined. The thing that we're, we work from is what's uh, called the supply push model, which arises 
from basic research and knowledge, it's uh, the end user isn't defined. We put this stuff out there with the idea that, yeah, we have a sense of who might use it, but we're not prescriptive about where the end point of that knowledge is. It's actually <laughs> freely available to be taken up by uh, any of the um, uh, any end users, uh, uh, including uh, exploration industry, but we may find that it's used for in, uh, you know, developing uh, environmental regulations down the road, for example. Uh, but primarily, we're looking at it as the um, as putting it out there for industry to use to innovate their exploration approaches, however that may be, and it's independent of demand. Um, we talked about the thematic approach of TGI. This is the uh, bubble diagram, or somebody one way called it the map with balls. Um, and uh, you know, it's not really about each of these individual spots on the map. What it's about is tying together all the yellow all the yellow dots together, so that we learn something about the processes which form gold deposits. Uh, we learn about we learn about the processes that uh, form uh, SEDEX deposits. Um, the ore systems approach, uh, which uh, started in Australia, we've taken it up here. We feel is the most benefit and the uh, uh, widest applicability uh, 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 across the uh, industry as well as across the country. And really the focus is on processes, not characteristics. So we're really trying to change it to an understanding of the processes that form ore deposits. Uh, and not a description of the characteristics of a particular ore deposit. And it partly encapsulates within this diagram, uh, you know, in the past with TGI-3, I think we were very focused on the mineral deposit model on the characteristics side. Uh, with JAM, JAM is really focused on the re regional geoscience side. TGI-4 tries to come up through the middle and uh, and really the philosophy behind it is that uh, uh, understanding the ore systems and the processes of formation of ore systems will allow us to define the targeting elements. So that should tell us what changes happen within a system and then we should be able to target it and then you should be able to say to target it we need these innovative technologies. I'll point out that you can run it the other way around just as easily uh, and it's a philosophical construct. There's no right or wrong to this. So don't, uh, you know, one's not better than the other. Uh, you can have a new technology that lets you measure something that you previously couldn't measure before that tells you something about the processes of ore formation. We in TGI-4 have very, made the very clear um, decision to run it from the ore system upwards to the innovative exploration technologies. Um, and you know, we tend to leave the innovative exploration technologies to the industry. We've done some of it in-house uh, for our own purposes, and I'll show some of that. But in general, we're focused on the bottom part of that. Uh, I talked about the collaborative uh, delivery of it, 200 participants, uh, provincial territorial surveys. Uh, they have science, technical, regional expertise, academia, science expertise, and student training. Exploration industry and industry associations you know, is, uh, provide us with our guidance and site-specific data, as well as collaborative studies. Uh, and the GSC, TGI-4, you know, we're, we're doing the program management, the science and technical expertise as well. Uh, but we very much work in a collaborative sense. We can't do this alone, and we uh, very much uh, try and make sure that the research is directed. I think we're trying to fill that gap between basic research and applied research, and I, I would call it we're carrying out directed research. So some of the results, uh, we had uh, Murray Duke uh, go interview some industry, uh, interview our people about a year ago. He kind of identified about 45 uh, distinct TGI-4 methods and scientific results that um, were easily identifiable. Um, and they more or less fell, uh, there's been more since then, uh, fell within these uh, three uh, areas, advanced ore system mod modeling, so studies that change industries, understanding of the genesis of uh, deposits, uh, new areas of mineral prospectivity, so defining new regions that were previously not considered for, uh, for exploration, and uh, new methodologies uh, to support ore system knowledge. 
Uh, so, in, and these are new methodologies that help us understand how the ore system forms. Um, the first one that that I'll put up here uh, in advanced ore system modeling is a uh, is an outgrowth of some work by Wouter Bleeker, working in the Abitibi Belt, uh, where he um, identified that. Uh, there was an early stage of um, extensional faulting that was necessary to uh, mobilize the gold into the system. Uh, concomitant with that uh, uh, extensional regime was the uh, formation of alkaline magnetism. That alkaline magnetism serves as a marker for the gold deposition and uh, subsequent um, uh, shortening uh, and erosion led to uh, uh, and uh, led to the um, uh, preferential preservation of the gold in, uh, in the uh, structural footwall uh, of uh, the greenstone belt and uh, explains uh, why about 99% uh, of the gold deposits in the Abitibi are on the north side of those faults. Uh, Loder also pointed out that this model is ap applicable uh, in general with Rice Lake Belt in Manitoba, with the Yellowknife Greenstone Belt, with the Ilgarn, uh, he sees similar characteristics. So this, this is an, an example of how something that's carried out in one place can be transportable uh, in a general sense to wherever companies are working. Uh, and there's uh, just a, I figured I'd throw a rock shot on in here <laughs> to remind me what geology looks like. Um, New areas of prospectivity, uh, some of the work on our uh, nickel um, chrome uh, studies, mafic ultra mafic studies, uh, in uh, southern Manitoba through northern Ontario, the Ring of Fire region into northern Quebec, uh, suggest, uh, following on Greg Stott's work, uh, that uh, this, this is a, a super domain for nickel, of uh, enriched in nickel chrome, much the same way that the Abitibi is enriched in gold. That helps direct companies to maybe think about their exploration strategies and what they're looking for in this region. And uh, you know, it, it falls out of the recognition that there's that there's several generations of ultramafic rocks within um, within uh, the Oxford Stull Le Grand, uh, uh, what they're calling super domain, that are all related in time and uh, potentially in terms of their metallogenic potential. Uh, new methodology supporting ore system knowledge. Uh, I'm going to highlight the labor 3D seismic experiment where we integrated uh, geoscience research on uh, precious metal BMS deposits with active seismic, passive seismic, which is a new uh, way of um, using the ambient noise in the region to, um, and the, the real uh, interesting thing for us was whether it could be used within a complex uh, geological domain it had been used in fairly simplistic uh, uh, geological uh, settings um, in the oil and gas industry. But then we brought it all together in 3D modeling of buried ore. Um, this is sort of a flow chart of the gold enrichment mechanisms in DMS that carried over into the 3D modeling of the uh, Laylor deposit. Um, and, uh, pulling, and this slide just kind of pulls together all the different data sets and different parameters to uh, create a uh, massive ore deposit. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the uh, interferometry uh, passive seismic component. Uh, I put up this slide. This was uh, one of the first examples of where it was uh, tested out in the Los Angeles basin. You're looking at 5,000 geophones sitting out there for weeks at a time, but you don't need an explosive source. You basically create a virtual source from the ambient noise in the environment, from the mining trucks running back and forth, and you integrate the signals that you receive across all of those geophones. It's a massive uh, processing exercise, but um, uh, it's uh, much more environmentally friendly, and it has a potential to be uh, far cheaper uh, in the, as it develops in the future. And uh, this is the results of the active seismic uh, where they did highlight a very clear picture of the BMS uh, deposit, BMS potential in, uh, in the Laylor camp. And the passive seismic, uh, much noisier, like we expected, a um, little grainier, 
But nevertheless, you can see the same, uh, uh, same reflectors that you see within the uh, active seismic, uh, showing that there is really some potential for use within um, these types of uh, deposit environments. The outcomes for TGI-4, um, I think we've stimulated some private sector innovation uh, in the exploration for mineral de deposits. We're providing that uh, data and knowledge. We've uh, tried to be very open about what we do. We've created uh, perhaps, uh, there's right now about 350, we're actually going, edging up towards 500 scientific publications that have come out of this. Some of them are as simple as posters that were presented at uh, meetings, but our feeling is that just because the poster is presented at a meeting, uh, it should be available to anyone who wants to see it. And we're a public geoscience agency, which means that our job is to get it out there as soon as possible for industry to use. Uh, in other words, we don't have blackout periods and we want to just make sure the data is accurate uh, and appropriate and get it out there. Uh, we've generated more than 13 million of in-kind uh, support from industry, provinces, territories, and academia. Um, we've seen some uh, surveys of the companies uh, tend to be universally positive about the uh, results and how they will use them. PDAC has been uh, very positive about this as being a necessary component for the industry as a whole. Um, I'll finish off, uh, I talked a little bit about the Open Geoscience. We released here at this meeting uh, the very first of our synthesis volumes on those ore deposit um, ore systems. Uh, uranium has just come out, it's available on our website. Uh, it encapsulates and brings together all the disparate pieces and parts of the uranium project uh, into um, uh, some sort of common picture so that you can see how all the individual activities all tie together into uh, uh, and how they may support uh, exploration um, uh, innovation going forward. All the other deposits are nearing, oh sorry, all the other ore systems, falling back into old habits, uh, all the other ore systems are coming out over the next uh, three to six week period, keep your eye open for it. Um, you can uh, pick them up uh, from uh, through our website, uh, and um, and I'll just point out that we have supported 133 students, 83 of which were at postgraduate level within TGI, um, and a lot of those are getting jobs, which in this environment is a is a good sign. Um, and I'll just finish off. There's our website. Uh, there's a, a link on there. The government won't let us put flashing lights around it or anything because we're the government. Um, but uh, there's a link on there that says RSS feed. If you click on that, it will bring up the latest publications, or bring up all the publications, but in uh, descending order by, um, uh, by the date of release. Uh, the booth we've closed, sorry, uh, next year. And, uh, <laughs> And, you know, as I said, our primary focus is to ensure that the data and products are publicly available in the shortest possible period of time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. Let's see. I have a question. Uh, Leaper 2014. Yep. Is that in the uh, report of activities? Uh, I think that one's actually in the Ontario uh, okay. report of activities. Yeah, okay. gotcha. um, but if you go on to our website and you can do a search, and it may not have the link to the publication. It may not have the link to the publication, but it'll show you the, um, the reference. It's all uh, so referenced within that uh, database of publications, so okay. you can get it there. Good. One um, thing that uh, Mike mentioned was this Lalor exercise that the. GSC was involved with, but there were also many other companies who conducted aerial, ground, and borehole surveys over La Lora after the last couple of years. And these were all presented at a workshop in Vancouver in October, sponsored by the BC Geophysical Society. Some of you in this room, I apologize, could well have been there, but one of the things DMEC did, uh, the proceedings were all captured in the traditional way. There's PDFs on the BCGS website but we recorded the proceedings. We actually had, it was, the meeting was held at the BCIT facility downtown and they had a professional recording group capture this. And we're now going through the 
process of cleaning up the editing, and this will be put up on the DMEC website here in the next in the next couple of months. But it's something that I've tried uh, through the DMEC to and a few other societies of capturing these meetings, and I'd be curious. I know there's others out there, but I would just wouldn't mind a straw poll of people who are aware of this type of meeting capture and have they actually gone and accessed any of these and if they have have they found them useful I as I say it's a certain amount of cost the one in BC was about twenty five hundred dollars uh, we're trying a little more informal one here where we'll just get the audio and the PowerPoint put together but uh, as I say there's a lot of people I would like to hope at some time could hear these talks but aren't going to be able to be in the room. But anybody's just sort of a comment about the media side of things, I'd be most interested. Somebody holding their hand up for the, oh, they're no. changing their diaper. No, somebody's <laughs> diaper. Sorry, Richard. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, no? Okay. So I, I um, just to point out that the session on innovation that the PDAC ran was uh, recorded, and yep. if you were registered for the meeting, uh, yep. apparently you'll get a link. Uh, you'll be able to get a link to, to see my wonderful performance in that session. It's well worth it. <laughs> well worth it. Trust me. You can download it through uh, through Apple uh, iTunes. And, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. And I'd also, uh, I did forget to mention, you know, we do have close linkages with uh, CIMIC. Uh, they've, uh, we try and work in concert and collaboration with them. Canadian Malarctic Mine in particular, we had a very good and fruitful, productive collaboration. I think we complement each other very well. We're looking at uh, these integration aspects from, uh, some, from somewhat different angles, and I think the two together actually build a very strong base uh, for industry to go forward. So what about the TGI-5? So I'm here to talk about the successes of TGI-4. Okay, there and, you go. Uh, the government, uh, it's obviously a, a government decision uh, to make about extending uh, or about renewing. Um, we've obviously uh, presented them with the, the what information they need to make yeah. that decision, but uh, that's their decision, and so stay tuned. Uh, Write some I, would, I would just mention that at, at, at PDAC we made a representation, uh, in fact I, I did, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Finance Committee uh, in Ottawa last, uh, last October. I think it was a week before the, uh, the terrorist attack, but anyways. Um, the, uh, the point is that PDAC, uh, our position was that we were recommending that they renew, uh, that they renew the, uh, the TGI program. And we've had pretty good, strong support from most of the associations. I know CIMIC has been uh, supporting us as well. Um, so that's all good. That's, a, as I said, it's yeah. a government decision, and they make these decisions from a, from a whole set yeah. of inputs. Yeah. But um, we, uh, we think we've show, showcased that uh, we, we've done some good work and useful work. So. OK, thanks. Our, uh, our next presentation is uh, by uh, Murray, uh, Murray Hitzman of the Colorado School of Mines. He's going to give us a talk on the mine mineral exploration geophysics for the future uh, from the perspective of an exploration geologist. So thank you, Charles. Thank you, Ken. Um, I'm probably the odd duck here. I don't <laughs> represent a big, huge center with millions of dollars of uh, research dollars. I come from a, a country which probably hasn't been up here in this session ever. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> um, we you missed know, you. In the United <laughs> States, uh, we produce a lot of minerals as well. But politically, uh, our country doesn't think about it much, right? And so we just try and close it down. So um, obviously, some of us do think about this a lot, who work with the industry in the industry. And so my perspective will be basically personal. We are, at the same time, at my institution trying to involve our uh, government representatives, the USGS, with Colorado School of Mines. Um, it's listed on the program that I'm representing, the Center for Mineral Resources. Uh, that's a new center which actually doesn't exist yet. We're hoping the uh, legal documents between our school and the federal government will be signed sometime in the next month, month and a half. It's been going on for about eight months so far. Uh, you know about lawyers in the United States, right? <coughs> Okay, so you're going to see some of the same slides actually you saw from Mike. 
as some of the same reasons. Um, this is from uh, Richard Schoede, who was here at the conference. And it really just goes through time, how do we find ore deposits? And the bottom line is, obviously, uh, the prospecting is getting less because they're not sticking out of the ground. And even though it's hard to see, but the stuff on the bottom, the geophysics, while it's somewhat flat, I would argue it's sort of going up. And certainly, uh, geophysics plus geochem, I think the trend is clear. And this is exactly the same slide, redrafted slightly. Uh, from Richard Shelley that was shown before, and there is a disconnect between dollars being expended and what we're finding, and that's worrying. And that's worrying for governments and clearly for industry. And the reason is, again, same slide, we're going undercover. It's getting deeper and deeper. And as it gets deeper, obviously, we have to think about different things. So, as we go forward, increasingly, I think the main technology will be geophysics. I don't think there's any doubt. So we need both better geophysical techniques and technologies. That's certainly not my expertise. I'm not a geophysicist. I don't invent no hard the hardware. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people out there doing it. Um, but we need to have better understanding of the geophysical properties of the geological materials. Yeah, and that's that true. is something yep. that geologists should worry about. Yep. And I think traditionally we've worried about what the ore looks like. And I think that's been very short-sighted. What CIMIC's doing is obviously trying to extend that and get beyond that as well. Um, so I think they're on exactly the right track. So we need to have integrated geological, geophysical models of ore deposits. And I think the CIMIC initiative is the first one I know of in the world that's really trying to do that. I'm involved in another one in Europe, uh, which is just literally getting started in the last two weeks, uh, where again, we're trying to do something very similar to what you're doing. And we're in the initial processes of trying to figure out our protocols, which is why I asked about the white papers. Okay, so geologists can help geophysicists uh, with the data so we can develop the best tools. <coughs> and one of the ways is better ore deposit models that actually work on petrophysics. So this is something that I worry about a lot. So one of the models that I've sort of been known for for a number of years is iron oxide copper gold. So I thought a short course a couple of days ago about this. And this is the model that was put out about um, 10, 15 years ago in terms of alteration through time, or through space, right? And so there's, you can see a kilometer scale bar, a five kilometer scale bar with these fancy names. And if you're a geophysicist, those names mean absolutely nothing to you, right? They're totally irrelevant. So, I, you know, as a geologist, I can, I can put some things on there that might help a geophysicist a bit. I can tell them about some minerals that have geophysical properties like hematite and magnetite. Um, some other silicate minerals, and that might help a little bit, but realistically, nah, it's not enough. So, what we really need to do is actually measure the rocks. And this again, Simic's doing some of this. Um, we use techniques these days such as CAT scanners, or in my university we have QuemScan. Um, and we do a lot of this already for geometallurgy or for mineralogy, petrology. But really what we need to do is do it straight for petrophysics. Right? So we're measuring the mineralogy, but we're actually measuring petrophysical properties at the same time. Again, Simic's trying to do that. We can do this now. We don't. Simic is one of the few groups, I think, that's actually